please check out our website, tttpodcast.com. Otherwise, welcome to episode 15 of season two of Travels Through Time. Hello, I'm John Hillman, one of the producers of the Travels Through Time podcast. Today we're heading back to the year 1889 to investigate how progressive politics played out in Imperial London with one of Britain's very best social historians. The poetry of history lies in the quasi-miraculous fact that once... On this earth, once on this familiar spot of ground, walked other men and women as actual as we are today, thinking their own thoughts, swayed by their own passions, but now all gone. One generation vanishing into another, gone as utterly as we ourselves, shall shortly be gone like ghosts at Cockrow. G.M. Trevelyan. This is a quote that the historian Sarah Wise includes as an epigraph to her book, The Blackest Streets. It is one that catches perfectly Sarah's approach to finding and reanimating lost voices from the past. Sarah is the author of three critically acclaimed books on Victorian Britain, and these include The Italian Boy, a study of an infamous body snatching case in the 1830s, which won the Crime Writers Association Gold Dagger for non fiction, and The Blackest Streets, which told the story of the old nickel slum in East London and was shortlisted for the Royal Society of Literature's Undaji Prize. Dr. Anthony Daniels, writing in The Spectator, said she has the true social historian's ability to make her period come alive. And in today's episode, we sent fellow historian Peter Moore to talk with Sarah at a flat in the centre of London. They spoke about Charles Booth, author of the fascinating series of poverty maps, a strike that paralysed the Thames, and some curious goings on in a Shoreditch church. Welcome to Travels Through Time, Sarah. Thanks very much, Peter. What is it about this century, the 19th century, that fascinates you, that keeps drawing you back book after book? It started in childhood. I wasn't aware of it, the process, but I was a late child of people who were themselves late, late babies. And so when I was growing up in the late 1960s and 1970s, hearing my parents talking about their parents' experiences and their grandparents' experiences, I always had this feeling that the 19th century was just the next room, if you see what I mean, but the door was shut somehow. And so I always had this intense curiosity about how their working class lives were lived. Added to that, in the 1970s, the BBC did absolutely fantastic Sunday tea time adaptations of the greats of Victorian literature. And so in a strange way, 1970s television was a really easy way to access the 19th century as as well. We had the original series of Upstairs Downstairs on ITV as well. And so in a strange way, although I was growing up in a world that was very different to the 19th century, it always felt oddly familiar. And if I were to look back and try and rationalise it, I think that one of the things that fascinated me was that it was an era in which there was lots of secrets and lots of mystery and lots of drama because it was a, a rigidly hierarchical society very uh, your, your manners and your morals were quite fiercely policed particularly if you wanted to enter the lower middle class or the middle class and so i had this sense of a world where lots of things mattered which had started to matter a lot less in the 1970s and certainly in the 1980s and so now i think that what i was looking for was a world of drama and colour. I just felt that it was some kind of party that was now finished that I was too late to have got an invitation to, but I was desperate to be with these larger than life, colourful, overdramatic people. And that, that applies to every single class, you know, from aristocrat to pauper. It just seemed a terribly exciting time. Let's just dwell a bit more in specific on the Victorian age. We're going to look at the year 1889 today. If you were to characterise 1889, how would you do so? I say that Britain was in uh, that un- very unusual position of finding itself perhaps on the verge of revolution. We know, looking back down the wrong end of the telescope, that there was never a revolution in Britain. But in 1889, many people thought such a thing was imminent. Trade and agriculture had started its long decline in the late 1860s. 
it was a depression that got ever, ever deeper for a wide variety of factors. And by the mid 1880s, Britain and London in particular were suffering chronic unemployment and a poor law, welfare system if you like, that was absolutely not up to the job of dealing with that kind of modern industrial unemployment, underemployment, plus trying to help out those who were dependent on those who did work. And so for a variety of reasons, it looked as though Britain could be on the verge of the revolution. Revo- sorry. Is this revolution led by who? Who would be at the forefront of this? Another reason I find these, these years exciting is the arrival of passionate, thoughtful, leftist politicians, if you like. So in 1883, we have the Social Democratic Federation, led by the very noisy, very colourful, Marx-inspired Henry Hindman. And William Morris, who's originally a member of the SDF, he doesn't like Hindman and his branch of socialism. So he breaks away in 1883 and founds the Socialist League, which is anarchist socialists. So the level of debate, the way that these people write, the things they're thinking, I find terrifically exciting. All these new ideas being thrown into the mix and seeming at that point to be able to percolate down to the working classes, many of whom are newly literate, thanks to the passing of the 1870 Education Act. We are now turning out boys and girls, uh, adolescents who are able to read. So I find I find the tumults of ideas and considering a new way of, of, of how England, Britain could be, I find it very interesting and the passion and, and the clashes between them, obviously, very interesting indeed. I have to say we're recording this on Brexit Day, so it's almost a bit paradoxical in a way to think that this is a great expansive Britain. We're recording it on a day when we're retreating back into ourselves a little bit, so maybe that's an interesting dynamic. But London itself, which is your great subject in, in many ways, is an enormous city of many millions, what, five million people at this point? It's maybe, yeah, four or five million. It's an interesting place to study. It's the almost the global capital, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. And the other thing that happened in 1889 is that London, at long last, after other British cities and British towns even, London is allowed to have its own proper, modern, functioning, pseudo-democratically elected London County Council. For decades, we've been trying to get a proper local uh, local government in place, always thwarted. But in 1889, the London County Council arrives, which is exciting in its own way, because we get at long last this idea, this blast of modern, progressive, democratic government that we can at last maybe try to sort out certainly the many uh, infrastructure problems that have been growing because of uh, deep neglect. I think that's a good overview of 1889 and where we are. Let's delve into the streets of London and let's have a look at them in the three scenes. What would you like to pick for your first scene? I'd like to pick Charles Booth himself walking around the market of Slater Street, Club Row and Brick Lane one morning, one Sunday morning in 1889. So the first and most obvious question I have to ask you is who is Charles Booth? Can you tell us who he is? What does he look like? What is he? He looks um, rather strange, considering um, he's an extraordinarily wealthy man. Many people found his appearance to be sort of shabby genteel, sort of tall, rangy, with a beard, slightly messy hair. Not really what you would expect a West End gentleman to look like, but he didn't care. He was a total maverick. He had no interest in what people thought about um, him in any regard, I don't think. He had inherited wealth from his corn trading parents in Liverpool, and then he went on to make his own wholly separate fortune with the Booth shipping line. Your classic, overworked, ambitious, entrepreneurial Victorian businessman But then he had a series of breakdowns, the nature of which we don't fully understand. And one of the ways in which Charles Booth cheered himself up, he played around with numbers. He loved statistics. And he was fascinated when the 1881 census came out and he poured over it. And he started to wonder, we've got this amazing database, but what is it actually telling us about people? He noticed that the, um, the ongoing depression in Britain's economy 
was leading to extreme um, poverty in certain pockets of Britain, certain pockets of London. And he thought, what is the problem with our modern capitalist system? It ought to be working brilliantly. Is there a way in which we can strip it down and see where the problems lie in the system and make it better? The underlying idea, the, the, the anxiety being that if we don't, then a lot of these noisy Marxists and anarchists and so on, they might just come up with something more radical and win the day. So I think there's a, there's a tension about if capitalists don't find the right solution, somebody else is going to, and that's the end of And capitalism. is it that dilemma <clears throat> that brings him to these streets? Because we should do the geography of this a little bit. You mentioned he was a West End... Yes. Man. He lived originally in South Kensington and then he moved to Great Cumberland Place just behind Marble Arch. And in a very, I mean, this is a very crass generalisation maybe, but you might say the west side of London is the wealthier part of it where maybe quite nice and residential, more spacious. The east end of London, where we're talking about Booth being at the moment, in Brick Lane in particular, is a more transient area, it's poorer the houses are more tightly packed. Is that a fair characterisation? We have Booth moving from one over into the other. So is he going to stand out? <laughs> it is a rather crude binary, but it is one that by 1889, interestingly, partially thanks to the Ripper murders of a year earlier, has started to be, be generally accepted. In West London, you have pockets of deep poverty, such as in parts of Soho, such as in the Notting Dale area over in the West. But generally speaking, what has happened is that the West has become the place of leisure and glamour and restaurants and hotels and, and the fashion industry. In the East, a process that's been going on for decades has kind of reached its nadir, where those who, amongst the middle classes who should be involved in local government and social cohesiveness, have abandoned the place. Charles Booth forsakes his rather glamorous home in Cumberland Place, and he takes up a series of cheap lodgings in places such as Finsbury and Shoreditch, and unfortunately, the, the diary that he kept hasn't survived. We believe Mary, may have, his wife, may have done away with that. But she did type up in her biography of uh, Charles Booth, she typed up tantalising extracts about how much he was enjoying living in the East End, which if I could read a couple of very short yes, extracts please, please, to please. you. Absolutely. So this is Charles Booth in the East End in 1889. Yes. So Mary noted... He is really enjoying his East End life. He likes the people and the evening roaming and the food, which he says agrees with him in kind and time of taking better than that of our class. The oatmeal porridge and thick bread and butter of his East End landladies. So one of the things, there's so much to value in Charles Booth's 17 volumes, Life and Labour of the People in London, is that although he thinks he's being purely empirical, it's only facts that he's after. He's sick and tired of novelists in particular painting London poverty in too dark, lurid and gothic terms. What he accidentally does is he writes some absolutely beautiful passages of eyewitness testimony of what he sees in the streets, which are unique, in which he absolutely captures the sights, sounds and smells and spirit of place. Now he... He, he had no time for any novelist writing apart from George Gissing. He said Gissing is the only person whose view of the poor of London has any weight or value whatsoever. And what I'm going to do with my work is sweep away all these dreadful dark pictures and these generalisations. But what he accidentally does is he, he, he brings his own rather sort of creative, deeply observant voice to a portrait of the streets. He goes roaming around uh, East London for his first volume, which is published in April 1889. And so the sights and sounds of, as I've said, Slater Street, Club Row and the Northern Brick Lane markets absolutely thrilled him. So he goes on a, a Sunday morning and he says, the streets are blocked with those coming to buy or sell pigeons, canaries, rabbits, fowls, parrots or guinea pigs. Through this crowd, the seller of shellfish pushes his barrow. On the outskirts of it are movable shooting galleries and patent Aunt Sally's, while some men standing up in a dog cart will dispose of racing tips in an envelope. He turns the corner and he says, Brick Lane should itself be seen on Saturday night. 
though it is in almost all its length a gay and crowded scene every evening of the week, unless persistent rain drives buyers and sellers to seek shelter. You see the flaring lights, the piles of cheap comestibles, and the urgent cries of the sellers. He goes to a music hall and spots that the keynote is coarse, rough fun, and nothing is so much applauded as good step dancing. He hears a, a couple of slightly smutty songs and sees the men laughing loudly and the married women sniggering, but the teenage girls have a stony impenetrableness of demeanour, which I take to be the natural armour of the East End young women, so they're just not having it. And then just one sort of final street scene that nobody else, I'm not aware that anybody else has spotted this joy amongst a really deprived and chronically poor population. He walks past and a street barrel organ strikes up a waltz and girl bypassers and children in the gutter begin to foot it merrily. So basically they all start instantaneously dancing the minute an organ comes past and so you see this absolute love of music and he says men may also join in sometimes and two young men will waltz together and then passers by stand alongside to enjoy the sight. A couple of ragged perhaps even barefooted children dancing conscientiously are a pleasant sight to see. We were talking about crass binaries before, weren't we? And another is that um, the people from the West are more cheerful and happier and they've got all these poor cousins over in the East who are living in miserable conditions. And I think here this is a wonderful challenge to that, you know, very simplistic reading of history where you have Booth really revelling. It kind of reminds me in a bit of this George Orwell you know the sense that he would always feel at home or would throw himself into this idea of tramping or or he'd like the little things but equally at the same time there's a journalistic ability or a novelistic eye for detail or it's almost like a Cartier-Bresson photograph isn't it he's he's freezing moments exactly right and as a novelist would do the Booth Poverty Map, which of course was published to illustrate his findings. Can you tell us what that is? Just yes, in the broadest um, possible terms, what, what were the Booth Poverty Maps? A good Marxist would call what, what Booth was doing was divide and rule. You take 85% working class population and you, you split them up into component parts. And so uh, he has eight classifications ranging from his own streets of gold, literally they're yellow and gold, meaning aristocratic, upper middle class, moving right the way through his colour coding down to black, where despite his intention to keep this purely about um, socioeconomics, people who live in the black streets are deemed to have moral failure as well. Your economic failure is due to your character flaw. You are naturally dishonest, you are naturally lazy, you are naturally a drinker uh, or a prostitute. And so he has his strict classifications of the London classes and he gives a, a percentage of how each of them fit in with each other. So the good news is, for him, from his point of view, is that um, there are only one and a quarter percent of the population of East London that fall into this lowest category of um, chronically poor and immoral. In the blackest streets. In the blackest streets, that's right. The good news, uh, which we all overlook, is the fact that the bulk of the working class population have regular wages. They may even have enough to put a little by in savings. They're not in any imminent danger of falling into chronic poverty. So they could, for instance, endure a bout of chronic illness. They could suffer a disability and probably be all right it's working class comfort and they may even be on their way to being on the lower middle class upper working class border so that's the good news that most people even in this chronically depressed time of 1889 are getting by without the help of charity and without any real fear of falling into vagrancy we're sitting here on the table in front of us is an absolutely beautiful copy recently reissued of uh, charles booth's london poverty maps we're going to have to put a few of these images up on the website. So yeah. if you're listening to this, go and have a look at our website. We'll try and get some Booth map imagery up there. Also, the London School of Economics um, and the London School have, got of Econ- a fabul- have done a fabulous revamp of their Booth holdings. And the maps are all up there for you to download onto your laptop. The Perfect. whole lot we'll, are there. We'll make sure there's a link to that as well. So I think we've given a pretty good overview of Booth. Fascinating character. Wonderful to watch him there in the streets. Let's move on from your first scene. Let's leave him in the East End 
pottering around, uh, working on his maps. Let's go to your second scene. Where would you like to go? I'm going to go to um, the down to the Thames, on the shore, anywhere like Limehouse or Wapping, or it could be on the south side, Rotherhive perhaps. And I'm going to be gazing at the fact that the Thames is absolutely motionless in terms of the traffic that's on it. Everything's parked up, no ship, no boat is going anywhere. All the quaysides, of which there are many little wharves um, upstream, they're all silent and motionless. There's about 300 of them, by the way. Also, you're standing there on a bright, hot August day. It could be any day after the 14th of August, uh, before the 10th of September, and there's a terrible smell in the air. So it's baking hot, August sunshine, and it absolutely stinks. And the reason it smells so bad and that there's this weird silence on this really busy uh, waterway is that the dock strike is in full flow. Well, 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 you've painted a scene which is enormously contradictory because the Thames is all about movement and activity and mercantile business going on. And it looks like some dystopia in your description. The Great Dock Strike is quite a self-explanatory name for what happened. But can you tell us a bit more? What's going on? Why? Yes, 14th of August, 1889, at South West India Docks. The men who'd been unloading the Lady Armstrong down tools and walk out. They were on five pence an hour and they were told by the, by the bosses, well, you can have a lot more if you get this done really, really quickly. And they got it done really, really quickly. And the bosses said, no, no, sorry, we, we said that, but we didn't mean it, you can't have it. They down tools and they call in great big union bosses, Ben Tillett, and instantly it escalates very, very quickly. They say you pay these men, in fact you don't pay them five pence an hour, you pay them six pence an hour. That's the famous Docker's Tanner. So they want one pence an hour increase. And the, and the bosses say, no, absolutely not. We've got endless amount of casual labour that we can use. We don't need to you know, give in to your demands. You know, We've got an endless pool of unskilled labour that we can get to do this work. 16th of August, 2,500 dockers are out at that quay, also at East and West India Dock. By the 22nd, there's 50 sympathy strikes across the East End in things that have got nothing to do with docks. So here at long last is this very working-class solidarity that had made Booth and his kind rather uneasy. 100,000 people march and rally in Hyde Park in support of the Dockers. And by the 25th of August, 130,000 EastEnders are on strike. That's both Dockers and those who support them. Now, the problem with that is nothing's being unloaded. So everything's rotting in the cargoes. Lots of foodstuffs, obviously. Not just foodstuffs, but nobody would go and unload those docks because of, because of this solidarity. You mentioned, right, well, I suppose at the beginning of this conversation, you mentioned that even though everything seemed to be going along quite nicely in terms of empire and Britain and capitalism, etc., this was a moment that we came very close to revolution. And in particular, do you think this is one of the moments where people were frightened? that there was going to be a series of events that could not be contained. And I'm talking from the perspective of maybe the government. Or, yes. Or so. Possibly, I think the big shocks that happened in 1887 and 1888 with the two massive violent, well, one of them was fatal, riots in Trafalgar Square. That had been a terrible wake-up call. The army had been sent in fixed bayonets and there was a general suspicion that the, the authorities had kind of lost control of the situation, had resorted to violence more quickly than they should have than if they'd, they'd policed it properly in the first place. So I think there was possibly an idea that the major flashpoint had come and gone. The thing about the dock strike, as with the Match Girl strike a year earlier in 1888 and the big Beckton Gasworks strike in March of eighty nine. Those two strikes and the Great Dock Strike, they were all noticeably peaceful and well-behaved. One of the things I notice about, let's call it the establishment and, and its mouthpieces, the newspapers, is that there's a lot more understanding and willing to listen to the strikers and the poor than you might expect. And I've seen that across the 1880s in much smaller strikes, such as when the costermongers 
uh, went on strike against conditions laid down by the parish vestry, which was is run by shopkeepers. So where you might think there'd be absolute hostility to striking workers, I think there's an, an element of London, you know, the London bourgeoisie, if you like, and uh, newspapers, newspaper editors saying, well, actually, what they want isn't unreasonable. The people running Bryant and May and some of these dock owners, they are rather penny pinching and it isn't fair to have all these people just hanging around waiting for a few days, zero hours if you like. So I think this idea that actually capital itself needs to start behaving itself means that I don't get a sense with the dock strike that this was seen as you know, the moment, because they were terribly well behaved. When they rally in Hyde Park, there's no violence, there's no looting, there's none of that. Peaceable meetings addressed um, by, you know, sensible uh, union leaders with reasonable demands. That's interesting because of the sheer number of people who were involved. You mentioned the figures before, 100,000 people, I think you say, were walking on the march towards Hyde Park. That's right, 100,000 rally um, in Hyde Park. 130,000 are actually out on strike and, and they're not rioting, they're not misbehaving, they're stating their case calmly uh, and their case is a good one because they are being exploited. Just to nip back earlier, a few months earlier to Charles Booth, you know, it's a kind of moralised capitalism that he wants. If we don't get capitalism behaving itself and being fair and reasonable, then we're in trouble. It's going to be corrected from below. Yeah, yeah. you can correct yourself or have it corrected for you. Mm. And so I, I think there's a there's an outbreak of reasonableism amongst um, amongst the amongst the newspapers and those in a position of power. There's two very strong aspects to the scene, I think, from my point of view, anyway, as I interpret it. Because first of all, you're a Londoner. You've grown up in London. You know the city very, very well. To witness it at a moment of standstill must be a heck yeah. of a thing. I don't know, in my experience reading history, how many times that happened down on the river. There would, there would always be flashpoints. That's right, yeah. There'd yes, there had always been littler lightning strikes at, at separate walls. Exactly. So this is different because people combined for the yeah. first time, you know, solidarity. And this idea of Britannia ruling the waves as well, there's yes. something particular about the fact That's that right. trade was brought to a halt at this moment of, yes. you know, free trade, expansion, yeah. the amount of different cargoes that must have been in the Thames That's right. at that time, really, really striking. And then beneath that you have, of course, the political aspects, which we've talked about in the context of Booth before. And again, I suppose if there was to be a, a commonality between these two scenes, it's the fact that, oh, well, moral dimension of working people, they're not always going to be bad. They're acting reasonably, they're acting interestingly. Mm. And is this what's drawing you here to, to witness this, this moment of... I think so. Um, just that idea of um, a hot summer day, a weekday, and nothing happening. I mean, it's kind of like the inverse of Wordsworth's view from Westminster Bridge and all that mighty heart is, is beating still. Well, you know, the middle of the day, not just the river lying idle and smelling rather bad, people notice that the East End in general, the streets are emptier, the bustle has ceased. And that's because people are, by this time, they have no money to spend. Because, of course, if everybody's out on strike, there's no money coming in. And so the shops aren't doing trade. Hawkers and, and costermongers aren't getting anyone buying from them because nobody has any spare money. The knock-on effect was also a rent strike. If there's no wage coming in um, because you're on strike, you can't pay that rent. Actually, there's a real problem with London landlords as well. There's a lot of anti-landlord agitation at this time. So people show their solidarity by withholding their rent. And so you have a total stillness throughout the East End in this um, August, early September. We have the Salvation Army coming along and running soup kitchens to try to help out because people are quite literally, by this point, early September, on the brink of starvation. Just at the point that they thought that they were going to be starved back to work, the Australian dockers come through with a massive donation to, to strike funds, and that, uh, that helps. So there's a lot of international solidarity as well. Right around the world, dock workers have heard about what's going on in London, put their hand in their pocket, particularly in Australia, and it means that these, these men and their families don't starve. 
to be there would be quite a thing. Well, let's. I mean, the smell of fish is going to drive us away. <laughs> let's go. Let's go somewhere else. Scene number three. We're still in 1889. We're travelling through the year. What we're we going to go to next, please? It's the 25th of February. A large, sweaty crowd are shouting and urging on two young boxers in the ring. It's the final, it's the championship of a boxing competition. And what's unusual about this scenario is it's taking place in the ground floor of a beautiful new church in the old nickel district of Shoreditch. The vicar, Reverend Arthur Osborne J, his pastoral work is reaching its apogee and he has got these fantastic lads, well-trained, and they're punching each other in the ring with a huge crowd, including a mother superior of a local convent, goading them on. Everybody's cheering. The fight is reaching its climax and the room is absolutely heaving. And there, in the audience, in the crowd, we can spot Sarah Wise (laughs) enjoying, or I suppose enthralled maybe, I suppose, by this spectacle. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the picture we've got to present to you. It needs a bit of unpacking, of course, yes. as, as it always does. The old nickel, we should point out at this point, is the slum and knee stand that you write about. These are the blackest streets. We were talking before about booze colour coding. The worst of all streets were the blackest ones. The blackest streets is the name of your book that you wrote about. And there you are, right in the heart of them, seeing something which is probably a bit incongruous to many people's eyes or ears or whatever it's this coming together of the church and boxing is that right that's right it was certainly incongruous in the eyes of the bishop of london who gave (laughs) reverend arthur osborne jay no end of grief in fact jay ended up having to preach a sermon called may a christian box (laughs) he had moved in to this area he had um realized that a lot of the boys and young men had absolutely nothing to do. It's anachronistic, but I think it's really handy to call. But when he moved in, do you, you mean he was kind of, he was assigned to a parish? There? Yes, he was, and it was one of the poorest. In fact, it was the poorest in London. Booth found 35% of EastEnders living in what could be described as chronic poverty. But in the old nickel, it reached its densest percentage at 80%. So the most chronically deprived part of London, and he moves in. Uh, because he's got some creative ideas for pastoral work. And so he is very well connected and all of his wealthy friends stump up enough money for him to build this spectacular new church, which Lord Leighton himself described as the most beautiful new church in in England. Fantastic sort of Munich uh, stained glass. But it was on the first floor because he reserved the floors below for a gym, a large club room where men and boys could come and spend their evenings, read the papers, have a smoke, play games, um, work out. He also had a little stage down there where they could work up music hall acts should they wish to. And over the years, I mean, I'll cut to the chase, he did turn out many champion boxers and he also turned out some successful Edwardian music hall acts. So it really, really worked. How much of a new thing was this in 1889? Has anyone done anything like this before? People were starting to fumble their way towards the idea that boxing could be an absolutely brilliant way of disciplining. You know, so instead of street brawling or this dreadful illegal bare knuckle fighting for money, for prize money, which did go on, put gloves on the boys, tell them the rules. And it was a, a good way of, well, not just tapping off the energy, but bringing a, a structure to their lives, a structure to the fighting. And of course, they could make money. He was constantly snitched to. In the records at Lambeth Palace, um, lots of other rival vicars write letters declaiming what's going on there. And um, he's, he's, re- he's breaking the hearts of local mothers, is one of his rival vicars, Reverend Robert Loveridge, says about Arthur Osborne Jay's work. You know, he's taking young men away from you know, their young brides. These young men aren't going back to their mothers and fathers in the evening. They're spending all their evening down at Reverend Jay's uh, gym and boys club. You know, this is not a good thing. And so he, he made a lot of enemies, both from above and uh, and his opposite numbers I have to well. say, we've been doing this podcast for, what, a year now, and this has to be one of my favourite scenes, just because it's, <laughs> in a way, it is a little bit bizarre, well, isn't it? But it's really makes it. I mean, do you remember, I mean, you're probably not old enough to remember, but when they used to show the wrestling in the early 1970s on telly, you know, the most vigorous people, you know, cheering people on are the older ladies. So I love the <laughs> idea of a lady in a wimple just really on her feet. Yeah, you know, going as, for it. As they're tapping the clout, yeah. 
<laughs> it's, just, I mean, it's almost like a sitcom, but it's real and it's 1889. And it's documented because yeah. it's Victorian yeah. England, so we know yeah. exactly what was it's happening. It's documented there. by Furious Vickers. And, yeah, exactly. Can we go and sit next to uh, Reverend Jay for a minute? Yes. Because he sounds like he deserves a bit more of a biographical exactly. sketch than we've given him so yeah. far. Is he well documented? Did he write diaries or journals or letters? That he wrote able three, to... three non fiction books um, right. and, and, and endless articles and pamphlets, are very proud of his work. His particular horror was the Salvation Army, which had got going under another name in 1865, but was instantly successful and was seriously tapping into the sort of money that ought to have been going on the collection plate. So certain elements of the Church of England are very worried about the Salvation Army. Jay's big campaign, not a very sexy subject, not one that really excites historians either, but he wanted a reinvigoration of Church of England parochial work in order to improve the lives of the poor. He saw at first hand how people were coping and living and there was no hope of things getting better. In fact things did get better but he didn't know they were going to. So he thought that the church's work needed to be vigorous and needed to be helping in a charitable way those who unquestionably deserved charitable help but like Booth like everybody in fact if we're honest like the majority of socialists helping those who deserved but not helping anyone who didn't deserve so that's the big task of everybody really to try to work out what does deserving mean and how do we accurately distinguish who deserves and who doesn't who can be rescued and who can be let to rot because of their own you know they brought it on themselves and does he engage with these issues in his three books he certainly does he yeah. does well here we are nattering on about social history and there's a boxing match going on over there and it's the 25th of february is it a particular boxing match which we have got to yeah, it, it's the culmination of Jay's ever biggest boxing tournament. So it's a Monday night and uh, we've seen eight lads fighting. The reward is a large marble clock. One of the most desired objects in a slum household was to have a clock of any kind and have a large marble one would be just a, such a fantastic prize. So over 600 people have packed into his little Again, huge gym numbers, stroke yeah. club. Yeah. yeah, and so these boys are, you know, tapping the claret, having a good old proper punch up and so that's what everybody's there to see it's been a very well publicized tournament he's um, got adverts for it coming up in the sporting life so people are actually coming from all over to come and see these lads see if there's new talent that you know maybe get to take it even further so that's what it is do we have an account of a fight? Or? There was a report of a fight in Sporting Life magazine, edition of the 27th of February 1889. And a cutting of this was posted by a rival vicar to the Bishop of London. And that's why I found it in the Library of Lambeth Palace, because he's been snitched up. Assault at arms at Holy Trinity Shoreditch. This fight was for a splendid marble clock. The room was crowded to excess. There were eight entrants with a weight limit of nine stone and six pounds. There had been three rounds between Bill Bergins of Shoreditch, C. Hills, amateur, George Rowell of Bethnal Green and a pupil of Harry Southgate, Hackney, Jim Brown of Hackney, George Baxter and Wag Norton, both of Hackney. In the main competition, Jack Maney of Shoreditch beat Jack Bryan, also of Shoreditch. Maney drew the claret on the second round. George Harding beat Jack Bigot of Spitalfields. Harry Emmett of Bethnal Green beat Tom Carty of Shoreditch. Bob Bellinger of Shoreditch beat Bill Abrahams of Bethnal Green. And then Maney beat Harding and Emmett beat Bellinger. So this goes on and on and on. As I say, um, an absolutely crowded room. Lots of um, the great and the good, including the Mother Superior, just cheering the boys on. In retaliation to all this criticism that you know he's got them boxing in, a, in, in on church premises, Arthur Osborne Jay preaches a sermon one Sunday called May a Christian Box. It's absolutely packed out. His church is absolutely packed out as he's in the pulpit. And many of the people in the congregation are his critics. Um, and so he says from the pulpit, boxing is rational exercise and healthy recreation. So the Globe newspaper reporter is there, goes home and writes up a hostile critique of his sermon. And the reporter notes the first hymn is Hold the Fort. 
and the reporter says it was roared out by men's voices in a manner that those who have never heard the pugilists of Shoreditch sing cannot possibly understand. We've looked really nicely three three scenes in 1889. What I ask at this point of every episode is if you could bring one tangible object back to have in your flat where we're sitting at the moment from that year and these scenes, what would you like to have? Well, I think it would probably be the Booth poverty map in its entirety. I got so used to seeing it um, as chopped up pieces, either digital or actually, you know, you get various inexpensive print, printed sections of it. But the, the first time I ever saw it in reality, I literally did one of those classic double takes. I found my head doing it. I was in a private gallery, um, Knightsbridge, funny enough, an art dealer, chatting away over the canapes. I suddenly looked to my left and I looked to my left again and there it is, framed and original on the wall of the gallery. And I had never seen it in its entirety. I just got used to, a bit like you know, to consider an A to Z of London. You get to see the whole, page, the pages over and over again, but to put it together and to see how far it extended and to see all the colours mingling together en masse across the whole of London. Um, I think I'd have to break into the gallery at <laughs> night, you know, <laughs> uh, with a bad mark swag, lift it off the wall, trip the alarm, and present it to you, Peter, in its entirety. Well, it's it's surprisingly me. large. It's, it's a large object. It time yeah. How yeah. big are we talking? Is this in its entirety? Is it all? Oh, it span a wall? Real big it thing? Was, it would span that wall, which is no help to the listeners, is it? Yeah, well, um, we're talking about maybe six I'm or gonna eight say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say it's something like Four by four. Okay. Feet by four. Oh dear, I've gone, um, I've gone imperial. Well, sorry. So, maybe we'll Brexit be, day. I'm sorry, Brexit I'm not day. trying to be a, maybe it, we're all, a metric martyr. We're all going go, yeah, to go imperial that. now. Um, well, it's uh, big. It's bigger than I thought. And it's weird to see the original after I've worked for 25 years looking at reproductions in various Well, that bit I view sense of, of the map, yes. but of course, I yeah. suppose the thing for you, and this is what comes through reading your books as I've done over the years, is it's not so much always the big picture, because contained within that are so many stories, many stories which we've lost, but many yeah. which remain to us today. Yeah. And getting back to them is always instructive. It's always quite inspiring. Well, it's often inspiring, sometimes quite sad as well, but contained within that map, is so much it's a it's an object dance with story so yes. maybe we'll leave it there sarah wise it's been an absolute pleasure thank you talking very much. to you thank you that was sarah wise guiding peter moore through the year 1889 that year along with charles booth and the brilliant reverend jay are all included in sarah's book the blackest streets which robert peston writing in the daily telegraph has called a brilliant social history it's available in paperback from vintage books if you enjoyed today's episode and would like to explore more of our adventures into the past, then please do head over to our website, tttpodcast.com. We've now 32 episodes online, from Michael Palin in the 1840s to Daisy Dunn in ancient Rome. Otherwise, to get the first news of our next episode, please subscribe to our feed at Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. Our next episode will be live next Tuesday, and we look forward to welcoming you back then.